So why do you need NATO if your principal adversary has disappeared? Why not disband NATO? People started talking like that. Well, they said, no, no, you need NATO. It provides security because the underlying reason for NATO, which is to prevent a independent European foreign policy to develop and so on, was very strong and had to be maintained. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. These are dangerous times. The U.S. continues to escalate its Cold War on China and Russia, bringing us closer to a potential hot war between nuclear armed powers. Why is the U.S. willing to risk nuclear apocalypse to weaken these two countries? Our leaders say it's about protecting the international rules-based order, about protecting democracy and human rights against an authoritarian axis of evil. But this is just a guise. It's actually about maintaining U.S. unipolar hegemony over the world, which requires preventing, or at the very least delaying, the integration of Europe and Asia. An integration that's logical both economically and geographically. That's why Europe is the biggest loser of this new Cold War. It's European workers, European economies, and European industries that are suffering the most under the weight of U.S.-led sanctions against Russia. A U.S.-led decoupling from China would be even more devastating to Europeans. China is the EU's largest trading partner. Is the EU really willing to commit economic suicide for the U.S.? Here to discuss this and more is Vijay Prashad, executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and author of many books, including Washington Bullets, A History of the CIA, Coups and Assassinations. But before we jump into it, Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can help it grow by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news or by donating below on YouTube. VJ, it's so good to have you back on. It's great to be with you. Thanks. So let's just jump right into it uh, because there's so much to talk about here, but Like I mentioned in the intro, um, obviously, I want to talk to you about the way that the issue of European and Asian integration and preventing and delaying that is really at the root of a lot of the U.S. escalations against Russia and China and this new Cold War that we're in. So in that sense, a good place to start might be, can, can you explain to our audience the sort of historical fact of Europe's relationship with Asia and what is meant by Eurasian integration? And we can go from there. Okay, I mean, uh, it's great to talk about these issues because they don't really get talked about with much seriousness. Um, Continents are artificial creations. You know, Europe, Asia, Africa, these are not written on the surface of the soil of the earth. I mean, somebody decided here is Europe and here's a line and Asia starts over there. Look at Turkey, for instance. Um, Turkey's capital city Istanbul, formerly Constantinople, is part of Europe, but the entire rest of Turkey is in Asia. You know, Anatolia and so on, it's all in Asia. Uh, In fact, even Istanbul has a section across the Bosporus, which is the so-called Asian side of Istanbul. Um, You know, continents are not real people. They become real uh, as a consequence of human uh, history. So Europe and Asia are one landmass. There's nothing that really divides this landmass. There's no ocean in between Europe and Asia. In fact, even Africa is linked, um, you know, through Egypt, through the Sinai Peninsula to Asia. There's nothing that divides Asia from Africa. Um, and in fact, the divisions between Europe and Asia have been quite modern. In other words, colonialism was an early division between Asia and and, and, and in Europe because, after all, um, the Europeans came and colonized Asia and parceled it up. So there was no natural relationship, say, between China and Russia and with Russia and the rest of Europe. Um, you know, the coastal regions are what linked Europe to Asia and so on. And then the Cold War, when the um, Great Iron Curtain descended in Eastern Europe, that was Harry Truman's phrase, Um, the Cold War also divided Eurasia. Well, after um, the Cold War ended, there's been a series of of reasons why the um, 
divisions across Eurasia have begun to vanish. Mm -hmm. And these accelerated after the world financial crisis in 2007. Um, well, why is that so? Because for two reasons. Number one, the United States prosecuted with European help three really crazy wars. You know, the war against Iraq, the war against Libya, and then the, the sanctions war against Iran. So Europe lost three principal sources of energy. There's, of course, Norway, which is a main source of energy. Also, the North Sea oil that's there in the United Kingdom and so on. But these are not sufficient. The large sources of energy were lost. And so Europe started to purchase more Russian energy. And here, of course, Russian natural gas came right through pipelines. It was cheaper than getting it as liquefied natural gas from other countries and so on. So it got to the point where Germany was getting 30 percent, one third of their energy from Russia. So one feature of the natural integration was Russian supply of energy into Europe. Secondly, mm -hmm. after the world financial crisis, the U.S. investments into Europe began to decline. And you began to see Chinese investments increase, which is why almost 17 countries in Eastern Europe joined the Belt and Road Initiative, an initiative comes out of China. So it's through investments that you see China and Europe begin to integrate. And then the Belt and Road Initiative, through the massive technological feat of building railroads, you know, that go from uh, Beijing all the way through Central Asia up to Lake Van at the border of Turkey and then link, um, you know, uh, uh, the rest of Europe to A Asia through those rail lines. Um, that's the nature of the historical integration. It really can't be stopped um, or it can only be delayed, but it really can't be stopped. It's it's on the march. It's taking place. And you mentioned the to the financial crisis. You know, you're talking, of course, here about the 2007, 2008 financial crisis, which the U.S. was responsible for, U.S. banking institutions were responsible for. And you oh, there's actually a piece you wrote about this whole issue of preventing Eurasian integration that I will link to in the description. But in that piece, you specifically note that as a really significant uh, time period in, being, in bringing about some of the integration that you just explained. But can you elaborate a bit on that? What was the significance of the financial crisis and the source of it? Well, certainly the financial crisis was merely a normal crisis of capitalism. That's the nature of that crisis. It was also a consequence of um, banks being unregulated and uh, over leveraging themselves. In other words, banks started to lend, make very risky loans in the case of the United States to homeowners uh, mm -hmm. who had not seen their, um, their living wages rise. I mean, United States wages have been stagnant for decades. Uh, to make up for stagnant wages, people wanting to develop, you know, a basic lifestyle, having a house and, and a place to live, send their children to college, have had to borrow enormously. I mean, uh, college debt is over a trillion dollars in the United States. Um, all of this is a consequence of the kind of harshness of U.S. capitalism, where people, in order to just make a living, had to have to go into debt. And banks, unregulated, were lending a lot of money to people and debt rates went up. This is a recipe for disaster. It simply meant that if you're going to over leverage so much, people are at some point not going to be able to pay back their debts and the music stops. And, and that, to a great extent, was the cascading um, you know, uh, origin of the financial crisis. Well, this made a lot of heads scratch, particularly in Beijing where the Chinese were rethinking their major holdings of U.S. Treasury bonds. You know, Chinese were at one point holding over a trillion dollars of U.S. Treasuries, securities. Um, they began to rethink their reliance on the U.S. economy as the buyer of last resort, as the stabilizer of the world financial system and so on. And it's as a consequence of that realization in Beijing that the Chinese began a new strategy. Firstly, to really build up the internal market in China so that the U.S. would not any longer be their buyer of last resort. Part of this, of course, was eradicating absolute poverty, uh, but also developing Western China uh, and, and so on, including Xinjiang um, and Tibet. Uh, 
which had been neglected uh, in the early decades of the of the Chinese revolution. All of that was in a way to create an internal market. And then the Chinese pursued a policy called Belt and Road. And that's where Europe comes in, um, because the Chinese began to understand that, again, this over-reliance on the United States and U.S. financial institutions w- was going to be dangerous. Um, at the same time, Russia had come to the understanding that, um, you know, from the fall of the Soviet Union until the world financial crisis, Russia had effectively become a satellite of the United States. You know, it, it was welcomed into the G8. Boris Yeltsin, who ruled in Russia from 1991 to 1999, was effectively a puppet of the United States. Vladimir Putin was the handpicked select. It was was the was handpicked to to replace Boris Yeltsin. And until 2007, was pretty pliant, you know, uh, to U.S. Uh, understanding of the role of Europe, the role of Russia, and so on. In 2007, he goes to Putin goes to the Munich Security Conference and he says the world will have no single master. That's the first public declaration by Putin of a kind of break with the United States. And why this is important is then Russia and China both slowly beginning to get feel the pressure from Washington, begin to interact a great deal. And the integration of Russia and China is, in a sense, the seed of the eventual integration of Eurasia. Russia and China have been in a border dispute from the 1950s right up to just a few years ago. Um, As a consequence of this new relationship between Russia and China, they settled their border dispute. Uh, And they talked then about various strategic issues. But more than anything, Russia began to sell a lot of energy to China. China began to feel vulnerable uh, with the sea lanes, you know, with the United States conducting freedom of navigation exercises, not only in the sea, in the South China Sea, but also in the Straits of Malacca, in the area around Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia. So China began to buy more energy from Russia. China began to make great investments in Russia and so on. So those economies um, and those political forces began to align. And I think that, you know, is a consequence of what happened in the world financial crisis. It sets in motion, you know, this um, uh, process of integration, which I I think should not be taken lightly. Right. And of course, uh, you know, you also talked about the fact that following that financial crisis, that was when Russian energy sales, not just not just to China, but you mentioned Europe grew, right? And then several European countries ended up joining the Belt and Road Initiative, which increased investments between Europe and China. Uh, And then I'm actually quoting you here. You say earlier forms of globalization in Eurasia were limited by colonialism in the Cold War. This marked the first time in 200 years that integration began to take place on an equitable foundation across the region. And the reason I wanted to quote that is because, you know, it seems to me that the European, I guess, Atlanticists, right, the sort of European leaders and thinkers who uh, are on board with like America first um, are the most upset about their current relationship with China and Russia. I mean, let's say the relationship before the war in Ukraine, uh, because it isn't one of domination like in the past. It is on equal footing. I'm just curious if you can speak to that, because that does seem to be like one of the issues that certain people in the garden have with with the relationship before it's like if we're going to have a relationship with these countries it needs to be one of domination and subjugation well i i i caught that reference that's a reference to the european union's foreign policy um, man who made a speech saying europe is a garden and the rest of the world is a jungle well played uh yeah <laughs> so um it's a, it's actually interesting there's two things to be said here number one it's very true that as far as the United States is concerned, this Atlantic alliance uh, requires the subordination of Europe to North American aims. Um, The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, plays a big role in this, in the military uh, flank. And then various trade agreements between the United States and Europe was to do a kind of economic yoking. Unfortunately for Washington, the trade agreements have not really gone forward. Uh, they haven't been able to e- expand. And, and part of this is because of a lack of confidence that the United States can actually put money on the table. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the U.S. government 
I mean, I know that the military budget this year is supposed to be 858 billion. But if you really look at it, it's closer to one and a half trillion dollars. You add in the nuclear stuff and so on. It's a lot of money. Um, this massive waste on military expenditure uh, means that the U.S. government simply doesn't have the cash in hand uh, to put money on the table for any kind of major trade and investment deal with the Europeans. Uh, so the Atlanticists, who previously had relied on both military security pacts, NATO, and on trade and investment to yoke Europe to uh, North America, now found that they, had to, they could only rely on NATO. NATO became the principal instrument. Well, NATO doesn't feed you, you know, and many European countries on a rational, realistic basis began to turn to Chinese investments, Chinese technological developments, and also the, uh, the uh, you know, the availability of high-skilled labor in China. You know, Wuhan, where the COVID-19 virus was first, um, you know, found in Hubei province, Wuhan is a center of a lot of German manufacturing firms, a number of car companies, high-tech firms, and so on, are located in Wuhan. Um, and they went there because there's high-skilled labor. You know, that's the reason they are there. That's part of the integration. It's not just Chinese investment in Europe. It's also a lot of manufacturing from Europe is done in China. And they are deeply integrated uh, through that process. Uh, so that's the first thing. It, it really bothered the Atlanticists, who you mentioned, that there was this integration. In other words, Europe was slipping uh, its neck from the yoke that the United States had placed on it. Um, I think that itself um, was an important indicator. But the other thing is, it's not like Europe has a problem with this integration, uh, frankly. The European Union released a report a few years ago, which I found very interesting. And, and here your garden and jungle um, reference is useful. Because what the European Union said in this report was they welcome integration with Asia, but on European terms. Mm. What they don't like about the BRI is they say, they claim that it's in, on Chinese terms. Now, that's disputable. Um, the Chinese are walking around saying, look, it's a win-win situation. Um, they're not saying it's a win-lose situation. They're being very uh, you know, straightforward. It's win-win. Now, you can contest that, say, look, it. It's not actually win-win or whatever. But the point is, what the European Union was saying is, we, had, we don't mind this integration with China, but we want to dictate the terms of it. So on the one side, you have the Atlanticists saying, no integration of Europe with Asia that will break the Atlantic Alliance. You can integrate, but you must maintain the Atlantic Alliance as primary. That's one approach. Second approach is sections in the European Union saying, yes, yes, we want to integrate with China, but on our terms, not theirs. And that actually is really where the rubber hits the road for the Europeans because they are stuck now. You know, they, they are, this integration process has been suspended in a great part by the war in Ukraine and by the hybrid war or the no, new Cold War against China. And that's actually a perfect segue into the next thing I want to talk about, which is the way that the, the ways that the U.S. is trying to prevent or, or obstruct, or I guess the way you put it, delay uh, the inevitable, which is this integration. And, and I think, of course, NATO is the, you know, the most obvious way at the moment. Uh, you know, when people think of NATO, they, of course, think of Russia because that's its reason for existing, right? To be this like anti-Russia military alliance. Uh, but one way that it's become clear that the new Cold War is more, you know, is about preventing this integration is the way that the U.S. has tried to reconfigure NATO into also an anti-China alliance. Um, and you write in your piece that uh, documents produced by NATO since about 2021 have become increasingly hostile towards China, specifically with these accusations that you know, China's challenging Western interests and security and values and the so-called rules-based international order, or whatever that means. Um, and that's, you know, specifically that that was a direct quote from NATO's 2022 strategic concept. You also mentioned that Australia, Japan, New Zealand and South Korea, which, of course, are non-NATO countries, attended the NATO summit for the first time where they addressed military cooperation against China. Can you talk about this reconfiguration of NATO into an anti-China alliance and why that's actually so significant for Europe? Well, 
NATO was established after World War II, uh, principally, as you say, an instrument um, for U.S. power in Europe um, to do two things. Number one, it was on the surface to provide security for Europe, principally against the USSR and the Eastern European communist states. So that was the, um, the surface motivation. But underneath that was another motivation, which was to basically combat what was known as Gaulism. In other words, Charles de Gaulle, who was one of the um, leaders of the Free French against the Nazis and becomes the president of France, Charles de Gaulle had a unique perspective regarding Europe. You know, he had a kind of arrogant European attitude that why should we be the poodles of the United States? We're going to have an independent French foreign policy or a European foreign policy, and that's known as Gaullism. So there was a NATO also provided a challenge against Gaullism, saying that no, Europe doesn't need its own foreign policy or its own military security. The United States will take care of that, you know. So NATO played that role historically of both um, being a kind of shield against Soviet, the Soviet Union on the one side publicly, but really it was to combat Gaullism within Europe. In other words, to combat any idea in Europe that Europe can have its independence, you know, both uh, in terms of foreign policy, but also strategic policy. In fact, that remains a problem. The European Union till today um, struggles with the idea of whether there should be a European army or whether indeed there should be an independent European foreign policy. There really isn't an independent European foreign policy document. You know, um, there, there is a commissioner of foreign relations, but they don't really develop strategic concepts for Europe, you know, that are actually authentic to Europe. They all seem to be photocopied from things that come from Washington, D.C. Right. So that's the origin of NATO. Now, NATO... Uh, after the fall of the USSR, found that its its raison d'etre, its reason for existence vanished. You know, if the public reason was protect Europe from um, the USSR, well, the USSR is gone. In fact, Russia joins the G8. Russia, in fact, becomes a, a partner of NATO uh, in the Yeltsin years. It becomes a partner state of NATO. So why do you need NATO if your principal adversary has disappeared? Why not disband NATO? People started talking like that. Well, they said, no, no, you need NATO. It provides security because the underlying reason for NATO, which is to prevent a independent European foreign policy to develop and so on, was very strong and had to be maintained. So new uses were made of NATO. Initially, of course, NATO was used in the dismemberment of Yugoslavia in 1999, plays a big role in that. And then shortly thereafter, becomes a party to the U.S. war in Afghanistan. And once the NATO forces go to Afghanistan, a so-called out-of-area action, um, a discussion opens up in the journals of U.S. foreign policy analysts. You know, people like Ivo Dalder and others start writing in Foreign Affairs, the Council of Foreign Relations magazine and so on. They start writing about the need for what they call global NATO. Very interesting phrase starts getting bandied about in the 2000s. Um, at NATO meetings themselves, you begin to see discussions about the globalization of NATO, NATO partners in Africa, NATO partners in, 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 in um, South America, NATO partners in Asia and so on. So now we've come to global NATO and then NATO's partner countries outside. Well, that's interesting because that is, in a way, the way in which NATO has been globalized. You know, you can bring Colombia in as a partner. You can have, um, you know, South Korea as a partner and so on. And so you start globalizing NATO. That becomes quite an effective means for NATO to establish itself as a global security force. Uh, NATO then enters another out-of-area operation in Libya in 2011. And... After Libya, it was now clear NATO is a global force. It's allowed to operate anywhere. I mean, you know, in Afghanistan, you could still make an argument for NATO's operation because um, the not Afghan people, but Al Qaeda had attacked the United States. Well, the United States triggered the NATO charter, uh, come to the defense of a member of NATO, United States member of NATO. So NATO operates in Afghanistan. But Libya. There was no cause for NATO to enter the Libya conflict because, you know, UN Resolution 1973 merely said that 
all member states that can should help um, you know um, fulfill the obligations or the the um, obligations of UN resolution 1973 but nato is not a member state of the un nato is a, a independent body which is comprised of un member states so it was bizarre to see nato operate in libya there, there's a kind of illegality which has not been sufficiently discussed but it was the libya war that in a sense gave nato permission quote unquote permission uh, to then actually globalize and you begin to see talk of like an asian nato when the united states with japan australia and india sets up the quadrilateral security initiative that was seen as a kind of asian nato um mm. there's talk of an african nato and so on this is all very disturbing at the madrid nato summit this year these things were on the table and they are now using um both the war in ukraine and the pressure on on china the kind of pressure campaign in the south china sea um to establish these two arenas as um as areas for nato's concern and an action in other words all of this libya and then ukraine and then the south china sea will become opportunities for nato to de facto uh, establish themselves as a global force as very dangerous because once you establish yourself de facto as a global force you don't really need de jure uh, confirmation you don't need legal confirmation for what has become a fact you know and th- that's what i fear is that there's this kind of 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 slowly sleepwalking into allowing nato to become a global policeman and that has to be really considered by people indeed and of course you know what this means uh in terms of how it would affect uh the europeans i mean china has in the last you know with nato being reconfigured as like an anti china force is china has in the last 20 years surpassed the us to become the eu's largest trading partner right and for the last 6 years it's been germany's biggest trading partner and of course germany's like the center of the eu so that raises the question of why would the eu commit economic suicide for the us which is basically already starting to do over Russia and Ukraine. I mean with its Ukraine policy which like you said that policy is not independent at all. It's literally just like commands from Washington. But why do why do European do European leaders do whatever the US wants even when it's against their own interests? What explains that? Well, they don't always. I mean, I I should say that the residue of Gaulism. Remember I mentioned this tradition in Europe of particularly in France of an independent foreign policy and so on. this residue of gaullism exists it remains um emmanuel macron all his problems set aside and he did look uh, rather lonely sitting and watching france play morocco at the world I cup saw that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> setting all that aside emmanuel macron on the question of russia and ukraine has actually tried to provide an independent direction in fact it was macron and angela merkel who put together the platform called the normandy four where the united states france um you know germany and and russia were talking about the um the ukraine issue in fact minx 2 and so on uh, was very much at the center of the normandy 4 discussion so macron right till the very last minute in in uh, february was trying to to negotiate with the russians despite us antipathy to those negotiations and even now there are strong currents inside europe of saying we need to separate ourselves from the us um strategic plan including again by macron and i know that macron came and and sort of bent his knee to biden in washington dc this december i i know that um that's also true these both these things can be true at the same time in other words at one respect european leaders are basically you know surrendering to the united states whatever you want master if you want us to arm the ukrainians to prolong that war despite the fact that it's exacerbating a cost of living crisis despite the fact that there are protests on the streets people desperate i mean the united kingdom is having effectively an advent calendar worth of of strikes you know every day there's a strike open one door it's nurses open the next door it's um it's rail workers and so on so you know at at one respect um the european leaders they are basically surrendering to the us despite these this ferment inside their own countries on the other side you see that they are also frustrated 
um, you know, look at Germany, which has really collapsed politically. The German Green Party, at one point a great champion of environmentalism, now calling for effectively maintaining in place uh, nuclear reactors in Germany. The Greens developed as an anti-nuclear party, absolutely collapsed their politics. You know, they don't seem to have an independent uh, integ- uh, politics of integrity. You know, and G- Germany is one example, but there are others. I mean, if you look at Italy, for instance, a far-right government has been elected. Before she was elected, Meroni was very strongly um, against you know, NATO and made strong comments. But once elected, she had to also bend her knee to Washington. These contradictions are real. I mean, these governments on the one side, um, there they are, you know, trying to establish some independence, marginal independence, because there's a groundswell of pressure in their countries. On the other side, they feel obliged. They are in a way trapped uh, by history into this alliance with the United States. And None of them seem to have the confidence to say, well, look, we, are, we want to create an independent European approach or we want to create an independent Italian approach. No, they're all in a way tied in. And let's face it, OK, after World War II, United States created a security architecture that yoked these countries. I mean, mm-hmm. Italy is still home to a large number of U.S. Ba- military bases. Right. So is Germany. This is real stuff. Exactly. And of course, I mean, we also can't forget that there's things that we don't know that go on, although sometimes we find out about it. I mean, remember when the NSA Snowden documents came out, we learned that the U.S. was spying on its German counterparts. So the U.S. even spies on its allies. I mean, there's all kinds of things that the U.S. does to make sure that the policies don't change. And of course, there, you know, it, it really speaks to the fact that many of these countries aren't as sovereign as they claim to be. Um I also wanted to ask you, VJ, what's the significance of the G7 in all this and then versus an organization like the BRICS Alliance? The G7 is really interesting. You know, it was founded in France in 1974 um, by seven of, at the time, the leading industrial countries, Japan, France, Italy, United States, Canada, United Kingdom and West Germany. They were the the seven countries. Um, The purpose of the G7 in 1974 was to tackle a couple of things. Number one, the so-called oil crisis. You know, when the Gulf Arab states used oil as a weapon, um, you know, uh, against the, um, the the presence of the Israeli state and what they were doing to the Palestinians and so on. That oil weapon of 1973 was very significant. It put a lot of pressure on Western European and North American countries. The United States had cars lined up for miles outside gas stations, Um, at the time. So the G7 met at first uh, to discuss the oil situation, but linked to that was the attempt by third world countries to push the new international economic order uh, into the United Nations, uh, which actually passed in 1974, calling for new dispensation, a new quote unquote rules based order for trade and investment and so on. Um, So that's why the G7 started. It was basically a little club of advanced industrial countries who wanted to privately discuss how to maintain their power over the world, not allow, um, you know, these third world countries to become equal. Um, I I remember reading for a book I wrote called The Poorer Nations. I read the uh, the transcripts from the first 1974 meeting of the G7, which you can see at the Gerald Ford Library. I sat and poured through those transcripts. So interesting to see the kind of quote unquote conspiracy that these G7 countries were putting forward against the third world. Well, over the years, the G7 has matured. Today, uh, the G7, which comprises 10% of the world's population, but holds 50% of the world's wealth, tells you a lot about who these people are. And they claim to be, in a way, the executive of the world. Uh, They want to and, and have sidelined the United Nations. They think they should make the decisions for the world. During the world financial crisis, these countries suffered enormous anxiety. So they went running to surplus holding countries like India, China, and so on, and said, look, if you put money into our financial system, some of your surplus, bail us out, in fact, then we'll wrap up, we'll close down the G7, and we'll create an expanded executive called the G20, 
which will include your countries, India, China, uh, Indonesia, Mexico, and so on. Well, the G20 was established, but after the financial crisis went away, they didn't shut down the G7. They continued it. It's very interesting betrayal. Uh, so you now have a G7 and a G20. The G7 has an incredibly destabilizing approach to the world because, you know, you, the U.S. keeps talking about rules-based system, but on what basis? You know, what are the rules? Who established the rules? Are they consensus rules? Well, the G7 doesn't have a charter, you know, from the world. It, it, it doesn't follow any rules. They make the rules. They make mm -hmm. the rules and then they, they execute the rules. At least the United Nations General Assembly is guided by the UN Charter, which is the most important consensus document in the planet because all governments are treaty bound to follow the US chart, UN Charter. Whether they do or not is separate, but they're treaty bound. The G7 has no such document even to hold the G7 members accountable, let alone accountable to the rest of the planet. And yet they behave like the rulers. It's a kind of global monarchy. Uh, this is not a global democracy. In fact, I could say it again that the G7 is a monarchical organization. They behave like kings. They <laughs> behave like unelected kings who don't have even a Magna Carta to guide them. Well, I, I mean, it, and then just to, just real quick, if like what's the sort of other side of that is this BRICS alliance that, you know, a lot of countries keep actually asking if they can join. Um, especially this year, like this year, I feel like every few weeks or every month, there's like some new, some other country that's like, uh, requesting to be a member of BRICS. Can you speak to the importance of BRICS, uh, in acting as like, uh, the sort of anti G7? Well, it's interesting in this conversation we're having, Rania, we keep returning to the world financial crisis, 2007, 2008, because it was as a consequence of those crises that the, in 2009, um, the countries of Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa met in Russia uh, to talk about creating a different body that would discuss issues of trade, development, uh, the world financial system, and so on. In fact, um, Dmitry Medvedev, in the opening of the initial BRICS meeting, talked about the need for a new kind of financial system because they were reflecting on the collapse of, of the Western uh, dominated financial system. So BRICS has its origins there. In fact, the pre-origins of BRICS were India, Brazil, and South Africa around things like subsidies in the North for agriculture, you know, very unequal subsidies, and the intellectual property rights that prevented a country like India, which produces a lot of pharmaceuticals, to sell cut price drugs in Africa and South America. I mean, that's the prehistory of BRICS. So, all of these issues came together in BRICS. Now, what's interesting is, yes, you're right. People are applying to enter BRICS. Argentina, perhaps Iran and others, Turkey, very interested in this. But that's only one part of the game. The other is we're seeing a renewed interest in regionalism. Uh, the new government in Brazil, which will be sworn in on the 1st of January, will have a finance minister, Fernando Haddad, uh, who, when I met him in October, talked at great length about the importance of South American integration and why Brazil is going to drive an agenda through a new currency called the Sur, the South. Um, you know, so you're seeing in South America the revival of SELAC, the community of Latin American and Caribbean countries, which had been set up by Brazil and Mexico um, in an earlier period, but now revived by Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. In, in Mexico. In Asia, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, again, has expanded. It's, it's got about 40% of the world's people in it. Russia, mm -hmm. China, all the Central Asian states, Iran, India, Pakistan, Turkey has applied for membership and so on. So there's a kind of interest in both regionalism, the SCO in Asia or SELAC in, in South America, and this sort of, you know, larger than regional bloc, which is BRICS. Um, these are emerging in a way uh, because they understand that they need to build some kind of political strength to confront the G7. Uh, 
uh, and the collapsing institutions of the G7, including the Bretton Woods institution. So, I mean, I think we're at an interesting period and I don't want to overanalyze yeah. this. Let it be. Let's watch and let's see what happens. Let's see what happens indeed. In in that sense, though, because um, before we were talking about the importance of China to Europe and all of the manufacturing that Europe depends on in China and all of the trade with China, is it even possible at this point for Europe to decouple from, chi from China without destroying itself? Just looking at the consequences of Europe trying to cut itself off from Russia, which have already been so dire, uh, and that was, the, you know, that was just really they needed Russia for the gas. With with China, it's like for everything else. Could they survive that even? And then it begs the question, because I don't think they could, but I'd like to hear your answer. But that also raises the question of, isn't it the U.S. also shooting itself in the foot because you're literally weakening your own allies? I mean, this is a, this is a question that one needs to ask the Europeans. Um, yeah. It's a really important question to ask Bossels and others who live, as you said, uh, quoting Bossels in the garden. I mean, how long is it going to remain a garden uh, when right. you don't recognize uh, that the rest of the world is, is pretty uh, interestingly developed and you still think of the rest of the world as a jungle, uh, stunningly arrogant, um, they need to actually reflect deeply because, frankly, China could live without Europe. But mm -hmm. can Europe live without China? I mean, China has integrated with Russia, with India. Uh, despite the border disputes between India and China, relations between the two countries are at a different level. China is, is rooted in Southeast Asia. You know, if you look at the GDP pro projections for the next 10, 15 years, uh, seven countries in the top 10 GDP are going to be in Asia, you know, including Indonesia, Vietnam, and so on. Seven out of 10, the center of gravity of the world is moving from the Atlantic Ocean to Asia. That's just a fact. I mean, that's all GDP projections are showing that. Mm -hmm. The issue is, does Europe want to be left out and become, in a way, I'm not going to use the words jungle and garden, but does it want to become marginal to the processes of world history. You know, if you're a Hegelian and you look when Hegel says the Geist, the spirit moves from east to west, well, maybe the spirit has decided to get on its horse and ride the other direction across the steps um, to abandon the light of Europe and go elsewhere. I mean, you know, Europe has to reflect on this. Do they want to be a part of what's happening in the world or do they want to marinate in their arrogance? That's that's their issue. That's a really good question. Um, and that does speak to you mentioned some pushback from people like or maybe pushback is too generous of a term or too like too hyperbolic. But there has been some light like hesitation. I'll put it that way from people like Macron, like you mentioned. Uh, and also, I mean, even more recently, you have the German and French finance ministers expressing concern uh, quite openly about the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, which is pretty discriminatory in its production requirements that basically threaten to cause the industrialization of Europe. Um, does And then you also have, like I saw there was an article recently, I mean, this is just something from today, the CEO of this one leading Dutch semiconductor equipment firm called ASML, uh, he openly accused the U.S. of using the semiconductor sanctions that it placed on China as a pretext to steal market share from European uh, firms. Uh, do you think European leaders of both, not just politicians, but also industry are capable of pushing back here? I mean, I guess it's just a kind of speculation, but it does seem like at some point, like if your industries are threatened with potential collapse and the U.S. is clearly making the rules so they can like use this as an opportunity for its companies to profit over European companies at some point, like someone, I mean, it it'll be interesting to see if the Europeans will really just roll over or if they'll push back. But so there are some trends that they might. Well, let's leave Europe for a minute and then come back to it. Let's look at East Asia. Um, the United States has developed this, you use the, the example of a semiconductor company, a chip manufacturing company. Um, the U.S. has pushed uh, 
against manufacturers in South Korea and Taiwan, leading manufacturers of chips, uh, also Japan. They are part of the so-called Chips for Alliance. As pushed back on these countries, essentially uh, cutting their feet out from under them because they rely on the Chinese market to buy their chips. Um, what are they supposed to do if you start sanctioning and saying you can't sell chips to China and so on? You know, what are these companies going to do? A uh, lot of problems for the United States managing these alliances. On the one side, you want South Korea, uh, you want the province of Taiwan, you want Japan and so on to be on side with the U.S. in its Cold War against China. On the other side, all these countries, South Korea's largest trading partner is, is China. Japan's uh, large trading partner is China. Australia's largest trading partner is China. But the U.S. has been trying to essentially break them off from their own realities. Well, it, they're having a tough time in East Asia. In Europe, it's increasingly difficult uh, to do this. I mean, how does a European company that, for instance, manufactures high-tech goods in, in Hubei province in China, where are they going to start manufacturing this? At one point, there was a delusion saying that, oh, these companies can just move to India. Let me tell you, it's not that easy. And there's a reason for that. Chinese labor is much higher skill. Uh, that's because literacy rates are much higher. These are the reforms of the Chinese revolution. In a place like India, nutrition rates are low. Uh, that uh, creates a lot of problems because you have poor sewage management. People get sick more often. That means workers are not coming to work every day, you know, healthy and, and focused and had a good night's sleep and so on. Uh, so it's not so easy to move a factory from Hubei province to even Tamil Nadu, which has the best workforce in India. You can't do that that easily. Um, so you're going to have to cut your nose to spite your face, in, in other words. And it's not just Europe, but a number of U.S. allies in East Asia are really sitting on the horns of a dilemma. Do they follow what Biden is telling them to do in September? The Chips for Alliance essentially was really struggling to accept what Biden wanted to do? Or do you try to chart an independent path? I don't know. They, they are actually caught on the horns of a dilemma. I, I, I don't agree with their dilemma, but I do sympathize with them because mm -hmm. there's no easy answer for them. They, of course, it's easy if they break with the yoke uh, around their neck, but that changes the rules of the game. Right. And I mean, it is interesting to watch. I mean, at least certain countries that you maybe wouldn't have expected to. It's not like they're cutting off ties with the U.S., but so, like I'm talking, I mean, in this case, Saudi Arabia, for example. Right. We just saw that the president, the Chinese president visited Saudi Arabia and you saw MBS really rolling out the red carpet, uh, partly as a snub to the Biden administration. But also you've seen Saudi Arabia refuse to increase oil production when they were asked to by the U.S., uh, to help control prices uh, and basically side with Russia, which upset the U.S. I mean, this is a actual U.S. puppet more so than any other than any European country, except for maybe like Lithuania. Um, Saudi Arabia is like a, a creation in so many ways of of the West. And so to see the Saudis uh, basically like forming this alliance with China that they clearly perceive as being more beneficial to them and their own interests, uh, regardless of what the U.S. wants or doesn't want, is really interesting. Um, and to see India to sort of pr pursue the, these like path, a, a path somewhat independent from what the U.S. wants with respect to Russia in particular is interesting. It's almost like you do see some more bravery from countries in the global south who are very close to the U.S. than you see from from these countries in the garden. But, um, you know, BJ, you, you also write that closer linkages between Europe and these two large Asian countries, China and Russia, provoke the U.S. agenda to prevent that integration or delay it. This agenda is creating a dangerous situation from the, for the world. Can you explain why it's so dangerous for the world? Well, uh, I said earlier that the United States government is now spending definitely over a trillion dollars on its military. Um, just earlier this year, the U.S. government released its nuclear posture review, modernizing nuclear weapons, developing new um, in, in this defense budget. They talk about funding um, sea launched nuclear missiles for submarines um, and so on. Very destabilizing materials. And in the nuclear posture review, despite Biden's claims on the campaign trail that he might put in a no first strike 
um, you know, a statement. There was nothing like that. In fact, they talk about uh, the United States will use its nuclear weapons if there is a strategic uh, requirement. Not that if there's a nuclear attack on the U.S., but if there's any strategic thing. Put that in, in, in motion next to the fact that Trump unilaterally withdrew the U.S. from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty, the INF Treaty in 2019. This is really destabilizing. You know, President Yoon of South Korea I think very irresponsibly called for mid-range nuclear weapons to be placed in South Korea. Um, there was a fear in Russia that the NATO thing is not significant because the Russians feared that the U.S. might create some sort of agreement with, with Ukraine to place mid-range nuclear weapons in, U in Ukraine. That would be a serious threat to Russia. That's why they kept asking, we need security guarantees. Now with the U.S. again dilly-dallying with Taiwan, there's a suggestion in the air that the U.S. might place mid-range nuclear weapons in Taiwan. And, and they started talking about, you know, again, about battlefield nukes and things like that. This is all very destabilizing. I was recently in Seoul, South Korea, met a range of, uh, of people who are involved with, with the peace movement, politicians. I spoke in the National Assembly in South Korea raised the issues of the new Cold War and people are very concerned about it. The day I was in, one of the days I was in Seoul, um, the United States, South Korea and Japan conducted a military exercise off the coast of, of, of the Korean Peninsula and the Sea of Japan and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea, fired 100 missiles into the sea in retaliation. So, you know, it's extraordinarily tense and dangerous and we are at a hair trigger level. There's a good reason why the Bulletin of uh, Atomic uh, Scientists, you know, they have a thing called the Doomsday Clock, which they've mm -hmm. run since the 19 whatever. Um, this year, the Doomsday Clock is sitting seven seconds to midnight. Midnight is when the world ends, essentially. Seven seconds is the closest it's been to midnight. That's their interpretation. And that's why I, I feel that we are very in a very dangerous situation. Um, you know, the, these these flashpoints are being pushed upon by the U.S., pressuring countries, you know, pressuring the Korean Peninsula, pressuring China with Taiwan, pressuring Russia with Ukraine and so on, bringing us to the point of, of a serious nuclear exchange, which I think is catastrophic. Yeah, for, uh, of course, <laughs> definitely catastrophic. Vijay, I wanted to just one more thing I want to ask you about. And actually, this really deserves like its own episode, but I would be remiss not to ask you about it because you just wrote a re really important piece on the issue of France and Africa. Uh, and I mean, specifically, Burkina Faso and Mali have recently kicked out French troops, which is quite significant. Mali, of course, is under sanction now. Uh, and you write that France has used the growing anti Russia sentiment in the West to argue that its losses in Africa are not due to its own neocolonial adventures but rather are caused by Russia's predatory project on the continent. And that just really spoke to me because, I mean, it's like this anti-Russia hysteria is like the gift that keeps on giving. Can you talk a little bit about the significance of what's going on uh, with respect to France and Africa uh, and the way that this new Cold War is used by these colonial powers or invoked by these colonial powers like to justify, or not maybe not justify, to explain away their own failures. Well, it's perfectly true that France um, has been booted out of Burkina Faso, of Mali and so on. Perfectly true. Um, but there's a complexity here. Uh, they were booted out, not necessarily for, um, you know, anti-colonial reasons, but principally because after the failed NATO-US war on Libya, French war on Libya, um, a lot of these kind of freebooter jihadis that entered into Libya, um, you know, as part of NATO's shock troops against Gaddafi, then moved into Algeria and Mali and so on. They wanted to take their jihad to the whole of the African Sahel region. Um, so the French then intervened in 2013 in Mali in Operation Barkhane to basically clean up the mess they created with their war in Libya. Well, it turns out that that Operation Barkhane uh, starting in 2013, lasting a decade, you know, and bringing, bearing very few fruits. 
um, about half the territory of Mali is in the hands of these jihadi groups. The military, deeply frustrated, began to argue that France was in fact collaborating with some of these jihadi groups. And that was the spur that had the two military coups and then the removal of France from Mali. Very interesting. Um, at the same time, the military decided to cut deals with, with the Wagner group, Russian Wagner group, but they brought just a few hundred mercenaries to join them in some of these fights. The Europeans have been exaggerating the role of the Wagner group, but it's just a few hundred people, not the tens of thousands of French troops that had been in the area over the course of this decade. Interestingly, this is not the end of Western imperialism because in, um, in, in Ghana, something was started in 2017 called the Accra Initiative, which brings together the British at the center of things. You know, United States has taken over a terminal in Accra International Airport, mm -hmm. it's using it as a military base and so on. The U.S. has a number of bases in the Sahel region. In a way, the French are being booted out, but the French, the United States and the U.K. are in the saddle here. Um, mm -hmm. There's just a few hundred Russians there. You know, it's not a significant force. But fr British troops are going to start entering Ghana. I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. But there's a big controversy in Ghana. The president has had to deny um, that, you know, British troops are there. Then they said, well, maybe they are there. The president earlier denied that the Americans have taken over an airport and then had to admit that they took over an airport and so on. It's a very complicated situation on the African continent. But certainly Russia is used as the boogeyman. But um, the United States and the UK and France in other places are still right there. Yeah, I'll definitely link to the piece that I referenced that you wrote uh, in the description. Vijay, I want to thank you for once again coming back and breaking all this down. It's always so wonderful to have you on. It's great to be with you. Take care of yourself. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you want to see more progressive anti-imperialist content like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with the latest breakthrough news content. And if you want to support our work and get access to exclusive content, Head over to patreon.com slash breakthrough news.